Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ryan. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Mufri, and I will tell that story because it's a fun one. But first, I made like semi-unrelated slides that I'll talk through first. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, developing the animal-free future of dairy, which is sort of like what does that even mean? Because dairy comes from cows, and cows are animals, so animal-free. How does that work? Uh, well, put it really simply. Whoops, sorry guys. We're making milk and cheese and yogurt and ice cream and everything else that's ever been made with milk without cows and lactose and cholesterol and factory farming and perishability and everything else we never really cared for anyway. We're making milk better because we're taking animals out of the process. And that's the, the underlying, that's the theme that I think brings this movement uh, together. And that's, that's what Ella was, was talking about a little bit with the symposium uh, in the Netherlands, which was really focused on cultured meat, but as I'll get, on, uh, get to in a minute, um, it's more than just meat. It's, it's about animals. And, and sort of, I'm sorry? La ooh. It's about animals. And it's like, okay, why, why do that? Animals are great. Animals are cuddly. They make food that we like eating. Well, the, the picture on the back of your milk carton, uh, of you know, you know what I'm getting at, right? The, the bucolic imagery of, of like the family farm with the, f like everyone's petting the cow, that's not reality. This is reality. And by the way, I looked that statistic up today and I was blown away until I realized it's from the very well-researched eating animals. 99% of all land animals eaten or used to produce milk, eggs in the United States, are factory farmed. Okay, 99%, which means that even if you think you're avoiding it, you're actually not. Because for every, like, $15 buy right container of, like, fancy milk that you get, you're also going to everywhere else you go that day and everything you eat has in it or eggs or meat or a combination, uh, unless you're kosher. Um, okay, so that's, that's pretty ridiculous, and I think we can step back and think about what exactly is happening here, and this is the process that we went through uh, in getting this idea and thinking about the technology, that fundamentally we're, we're taking grass, or in this, you know, in this sort of apocalyptic future of food, soy, corn, hormones, antibiotics, and all this stuff, we're feeding it to cows, which are really just gigantic sentient creatures slash poop machines, and they're producing milk or eggs or meat or whatever else, right? But there's another way to look at it, because in a lot of ways, we don't really understand what that creature is doing. And some of the things that people are proposing, like outside of this movement, the kind of things that the dairy industry is thinking about in order to make this process more efficient are ridiculous, because it's just a black box. We don't know what's going on. So why don't we look at it like a black box? Well, I look at it as a metabolic process that takes in elements in the form of molecules, in the form of plants, and turns them into milk, okay? Well, if I were designing this, there's not a chance that I would choose to do it in a thousand pound animal. If we want a metabolic process, the best way to do that is with a tiny machine that's optimized for doing metabolic processing, and that's a cell. So here's what we've done. Here's the same cow from before, but now we're doing it in a better way, which is called a bioreactor, okay? And essentially, we're using yeast. We took the same molecular machinery that cows do, that cows use to turn their feed into milk, and we've moved that into yeast. And that gives us so many advantages, not only in terms of you know, the, the junk that you have to put into the feed, feed a cow. We don't have to do that. But also, we can control the process better. The economics are better. We can, uh, we can produce pure milk proteins that are totally clean and sterile. And once we have those milk proteins, we can do whatever we want with them. So in this case, we can turn them into milk, we can turn them into cheese, we can turn them into anything else designed to whatever spec you want. So that means, well, we don't want lactose, we don't want cholesterol anymore, or you know, there's good and there's bad, whatever, right? All of these things are made possible because we're taking a different approach to the entire problem. It's not how do you feed the cow something different, or you pet it a certain way, or you play classical music to it. It's, you forget about the cow at all, or engineer the cow, right? That's the one that I heard about, is that people were actually doing a GMO cow, which is like all the bad things, all the things that people think are about what we're doing, with all of the negatives of, of the existing infrastructure. It makes no sense to me. This is, this is the alternative. This is the future of milk. This is the future of dairy, because we're doing it in a more efficient way. And the benefits, this is only the environmental benefits, but they're gigantic, they're staggering. In terms of water consumption, especially in drought-stricken California, I think that's, you know, people talk about 
like turn off your sink or like stop taking a shower. It's really the 99% of, uh, of your animal foods are coming from factory farms, which are super water intensive. It's 1,000 liters of water to make one liter of milk. Well, this is 98% less. Similarly, less land usage, and uh, most, actually 91% of the degradation of the Amazon is because of animal agriculture. You can address that using biotechnology. Carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, in general, I think, I think the statistic is uh, animal agriculture in general has a larger impact on our anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions than every type of transportation combined. So we know someone who, uh, who refuses to, to travel by air. He'll only take ships around, which like, seems like the opposite way to do it, if anything. But uh, this guy eats meat like no tomorrow. And it's like you're, you're undoing like, every flight you could have taken for 10 lifetimes with every steak you eat. It just makes no sense. This is where the impact is. It's in food, because every single person, every single one of the 7 billion people now and 9 billion tomorrow eat food three times a day. So that impact is sitting there right in front of all of us. And to investors, we say, well, those are also customers. So there's a lot. Anyway, that's actually like, I think that's all I did for slides. So, you know, forget the slides. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure like how long I'm intended to be up here. But feel free to ask questions. I'm happy to answer them because I know that it's, you know, people come here with different levels of understanding and past knowledge about this, this in particular and sort of, Hacking biology for good in general, uh, you know, in particular. So whatever. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. How do you deal with perishability? How do we deal? Like how do how do we claim that we can get away with per? Uh, when milk comes. Yeah, sure. So the question was, how do we deal with perishability? I think, I think more specifically, the question refers to the fact that I claimed at the beginning, right, that we can address perishability in milk, and the reason we can do that is because when you milk a cow, you're, making, you're, you're taking this fluid that is just swimming with bacteria and yeast and literal feces, right? That's, that's not even whatever. So you, you pasteurize it. There are still viable bacteria in that milk after you pasteurize it, and it goes bad. And milk is known for going bad quickly. It's like when you think about spoilage, you're thinking about dairy, or I am, uh, although I guess I have my own reasons. But you know, we're, we're creating a product that is super, like, everything that is in it, every molecule in this product is what we decided should be in there, in the exact amount we decided should be in there. And as it turns out, we don't think there's room for any bacteria in our products, right? So that, that's a choice we can make because we're using 21st century engineering principles to design food, as it should be. So you said that it required 91% as much land use? 91% less. Lines, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, and so it, that seems like actually a lot, given how much land cows require. So what, what, what did that land be used for in the model? The, the land that's used for cattle isn't just about grazing. It's also about the land used to grow the inefficient amount of feed that the cows require. And I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that in the life cycle analysis for milk that we were comparing against, they were including a lot of land used for uh, for plants. But actually, now that I think about it, I think it is more about grazing. Because you just clear off so much rainforest, right, for these animals. I was actually saying, I would expect it to be more than 91% less. Oh. So what, what, what land uh, are you using in the solution? This is probably it, right? And I, sh I should check this. But I'm pretty sure the difference is, what we're, what we're counting for our land isn't just, here's our tank, right? We're also doing our, our full life cycle analysis. And we're saying, well, we have to put feed into this reactor. It's going to be coming from plants at the end of the day. Those plants were somewhere, okay, that's 9%, right, of what it would take to, to grow food and graze animals on it. Hey, yeah. I'm super excited about this, so where can I try it? Okay, we have, like, good call, man. Hey, good organizer here. Uh, the question was, I'm super excited, and thank you. Uh, <laughs> that was the whole question. Now, uh, where and when can I try it, right? Um, we have, we have very limited samples right now at our lab, which is in South San Francisco, kind of right in the heart of the biotech industry. Um, we will have more samples in the next year, and we're hoping to have actual like pilot level products available uh, in sort of limited stores in the Bay Area by the end of 2017.
So, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I got really excited about this idea, is because, well, and maybe Memphis Meat disagrees with me, but it seemed to me like a year and a half ago that cultured meat is not going to be able to commercialize and be available for like you to use in your home within 10 years. And please, but, you know, that, that was the impression I had because I worked on it in college and, and I knew just how crazy, you know, behind it is uh, in terms of getting actual structure of viable mammal cells that the best understanding we have today is we're pretty sure they won't die if we feed them this like $600 per gram mixture. It's like, okay, how does that turn into a hamburger, you know? But, but this is available a lot sooner. So w we're seriously like, it's, it's now 2016, Happy New Year. And by the end of next year, this should be available for you to buy. Yep. Um, after what we've just seen happen to like the raw milk industry, what kind of rules do you face with the USDA, FDA, and or the traditional dairy industry has? Yeah, so the, the question is, yeah, no, I'm on it. The question, given what we've seen with the raw milk movement, and presumably with sort of engineered foods in general, what sort of hurdles do we anticipate uh, bringing this sort of product to market, right? Um, okay. Oh, uh, you said with the FDA, with the sort of regulatory uh, bodies. Like the right hand of the dairy industry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's sort of two sides to the regulatory question. And one of them is, can you sell this at all? Can people eat it? And the other one is, uh, what can you call it? Okay, those are the two big question marks. Can you sell this stuff at all? Yeah, actually, it'll be really, really easy to do. And the reason for that is, we're making the exact same protein found in cow's milk, and everything else that we're putting in our milk is already a very common you know, food ingredient. These are, these are fats and sugars and everything that is very common. And the protein, down to the atomic level, is identical to what's found in cow's milk. So it's maybe like the most consumed protein in the world. Casey. And we've talked to the FDA, and what we heard back from them was, yeah, look, if you can prove doing this, 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 you know, non-clinical trial, non-animal testing experiment, if you can show that your protein is really the same as a cow's casein, then you're good to go. Now, what do you call it, right? Uh, that, I think, is going to be a little bit more of a hurdle because, well, you can't call it milk because the word milk has a definition. It's defined in, in the, the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, it's the lacteal secretions practically free of colostrum uh, from the adult bovine mammal or, or something sort of like that. And uh, this is that, right? So, no, we can't call it milk. We can probably call it, like, flank milk. Uh, soy milk is fine, almond milk is fine, right? And even if those are, like, technically not okay, they've been getting away with it for long enough that I think adjective milk would work fine. <laughs> What's that? One more question? Nishi? Um, did Move Free come before the proof of concept, or you know, you guys actually realized that you could play for Natus, or was there enough of a question of could you make a viable product that you know the, the making kind of came afterwards? Like yeah. So the the question is, which came first, the prototype, the the proof of concept, or the company? Right? And the company, are. And that, and that's that's a good chance for me to plug Indie Bio because boy those guys are awesome. We we met Isha, who didn't want me to point at her probably, but she's she's from New Harvest and I hope that she talks or something later. But you know we talked to Isha last spring, Paramal and myself, f uh, co-founders along with Isha of Mufri. We told her this was an idea that we were sort of bumping around, and when she found out that Indie Bio was still accepting applications, she told us about it. We and all we like, all we had was a team and I idea and a vision, right? And they said we we will give you guys, we will believe in you guys and see where this goes. So when Ryan was here a minute ago, not this Ryan, that Ryan, uh, and he said, "Hey, if you know anyone who has an idea, apply." Like, really, you anyone can do this. Ta-da! <laughs> Thank you, everyone.